Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome. Let's try this again. Let me see if we are live. Let's see if we are live. Yes, all right. So I got one person in. All right, so hopefully you guys have found me, Rita. Yes, so you can see me? Can you see me? And can you hear me? Yes, yay, all right. We are finally getting somewhere, yay. Okay, so I've gotta get this. Um... Okay, so it looks like I'm in the right thing. All right, so I've got this rolling now. So um, let's see here. We're gonna go to the live question. Okay. So can everybody see the question now? Or the, the it says New Year Game Show Live. Everybody see that? Can everybody see that? All right, all right. Okay, so we're on the right path, guys. Good, awesome. Okay, so take two. We're gonna start again, and you guys already know the answer to the first one, <laughs> but we're gonna go ahead and let it go through. Okay. Here we go. You guys ready? You get the first one as a freebie. Here we go. Observing changes in a resident's condition and reporting those changes to the nurse, one, is not a responsibility of the nursing assistant. Two, is a very important role of the nursing assistant. Three, is only done at the end of shift. Or four, should only be written in the patient's chart. So go ahead and type in, oh, why is it not, I still can't see. Why is it not, I don't know why this is not going. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah, it's not showing. Oh, guys, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on with this today. Yeah, I don't know why it's not showing. All right, give me a second. Let me uh, let me see if I can troubleshoot this a little bit. Hold on. Maybe you need to share the screen. Yeah, I'm using a program that actually does that for me. So are you guys all seeing where it says like New Year Game Show Live? Do you guys, is that what you're seeing? You're just not seeing the question? Is that right? Yeah. Ah, I don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, save changes. Okay. All right, hold on a minute, guys. <laughs> Well, we may have to put this on hold until next week. I, because I have no idea what this is doing wrong. I have no idea. Um, all right, so vote. You can either, because I don't know what what this is doing. We have two choices here. You can either hang out while I troubleshoot, or we can postpone it until next Tuesday. You guys decide. So hang out and let me troubleshoot. I don't know how long it's going to take. 
or postpone until next Tuesday. What do you guys think? Go ahead and vote because I'm having some issues and I just, I'm not real sure what this is doing. Postpone. All right, Robert says postpone. Yeah, because I, I don't really know how long this is going to take. Ah, I'll be working. I'm sorry, Andrea. I'm so, so, so sorry. I'm just not real sure what to do here. Continue, postpone. All right. Uh, okay, you guys want me to do it verbally? I can do it verbally. That I can do. You guys want to do verbal? We can do verbal. Continue, yes. Okay, all right, we'll do verbal. Here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> ah! Okay, here we go. Question number two. Let's go here. Question number two. Most accidents that occur in a facility are blank and may be caused by an unsafe environment or a loss of abilities. So most accidents that, are, that occur in a facility are preventable, one, two, fractures, three, unavoidable, or four, the patient's fault. So most accidents that occur in a facility are one, preventable, two, fractures, three, unavoidable, or four, the patient's fault. Go ahead and type in your answer. Type in your answer. You've got about 10 seconds left. 10 seconds left. The correct answer is preventable. Correct, you guys all got that one right. Yeah, most accidents that occur in a facility are preventable, absolutely. And it's kind of up to us to look around and make sure that they're in a safe environment and that there's nothing that's going to pose a trip hazard or a fall hazard or, um, you know, anything that, that might um, impede their ability to move about safely. But it's also about watching our patients as well. If we're paying attention to the patients and we see that they get a little wobbly or they get really pale and sweaty or they start reaching out for um, the wall or a chair or something like that, that tells us that everything is not well with that patient and that allows us to intervene before a fall happens. So it looks like Hishwanda came in first followed by Rita, Raz, Alexa, and Tamika. So we're going to go on to question number three. I'm so sorry that I can't put this on the screen for you guys. I really am. So question number three. This is the term that defines the things you are allowed to do and how to do them correctly. One, scope of practice. Two, liability. Three, textbooks. Or four, chain of command. So this is the term that defines the things you're allowed to do and how to do them correctly. One, scope of practice. Two, liability. Three, textbooks. Or four, chain of command. Go ahead and lock in your answers. Oh no, now you guys are, oh, now you can't hear me. Oh no. Uh. <laughs> It's not a good day, guys. Not hearing anything in the Wi-Fi keeps spinning. All right. Well, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to... Uh, Kishwanda can hear. Kayleen can hear. Ah! I'm not sure what to do. Okay. All right. Um... Give me a second here, guys. Let me see. I'm looking at my, my settings here, guys. Give me one second. I'm looking at my settings. Let me see. 
No, that does not work. Okay. I'm not sure, guys. You have to refresh the page. I had to refresh. All right. So okay. All right. So Andrea and Alexa. Okay. So we're back on. Oh, talk about technical difficulties at the beginning of the year. Ah, I hope this is not how the year is going to go. I hope it's not like an omen or something. Guys, send me some good wishes for the new year. All right, Raz, we're going to keep going. Yes, the scope of practice is what defines the things you're allowed to do and how to do them correctly. And that is what tells CNAs what they're allowed to do. Now, it's really important that you know your scope of practice for your state because, oh good, thanks Alexa, I needed that. Um, because each state defines the scope of practice for CNAs a little bit differently. And this is why when we have the, um, during COVID, we had this new travel um, thing for CNAs. They were able to travel state to state. We still have that around, but um, it's really important if you're going to be traveling outside of your home state that you know the scope of practice for the state you're going into. Really, really important. And that's what's going to keep you out of trouble. So for this one, Kishwanda came in first and got 10 points, followed by Rita, Tamika, Kayleen, and Sel Salamowit. All right, so we're moving on now to question number four. Question number four. I hope you guys can see me and hear me. All right, question number four. What should a nursing assistant do if she suspects a resident is being abused? One, ask another nursing assistant what they would do. Two, set up a security camera to document the abuse. Three, report it to the nurse immediately. Or four, determine if the patient feels they're being abused. So what should a nursing assistant do if she suspects a resident is being abused? One, ask another nursing assistant. Two, set up a security camera. Three, report it to the nurse immediately. Or four, determine if the patient feels they are being abused. You have about 15 seconds to lock in your answer. Yeah, I can't, I can't stump you guys. You're good. Very good. All right, do you want to ask another nursing assistant, set up a security camera, report it to the nurse immediately, or determine if the patient feels they're being abused? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to report it to the nurse immediately. It's not up to us to investigate suspicion of abuse. We don't have the tools to do that. We don't, and we can actually hurt an investigation by doing so. So if we think the patient is being abused by anyone, whether it's a member of our staff, whether it's their family members, whether it's a roommate or another patient, our responsibility is to keep our eyes and ears open and report any suspicion to the nurse so that it can be um, investigated appropriately. So good job. You guys all got that one right. Very, very good. Um, so our scores are, I hate that you guys can't see this. This is killing me. Um, <laughs> Rita came in first, followed by Tamika, Robert, Aminata, and Alexa. So we're going to move on now to question number five. Question number five. Here we go. If your facility uses military time for documentation, what should you do? One, Tell the nurse you don't understand military time and you will be using regular time. Two, add 12 to all hours after noon. Three, have the nurse convert all of your times to military time at the end of your shift. Or four, guess at the time and someone else can correct it if it's wrong. So if your facility uses military time, what should you do? One, tell the nurse you don't understand military time and you'll be using regular time. Two, add 12 to all hours after noon. Three, have the nurse convert all of your times to military time at the end of your shift. Or four, guess at the time and someone else can correct it if it's wrong. Go ahead and lock in your answers. And the correct answer is absolutely two. We're going to add 12 to all of the hours after noon. That's correct. So that's how we actually get military time. I mean, there's 24 hours in a day. We all know this. 24 hours in a day, 
but regular time just counts to 12 and then we start all over again, which doesn't make any sense to me. If there's 24 hours, use them all. And that's all military time does. So every hour afternoon, we're gonna add 12 to. So we just keep going. So when we get 11, 12, and says starting back over at one, we just go 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and so on all the way till um, the day starts again at midnight and that's zero, 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 zero. So good job, guys. So Kishwanda came in first on that one, followed by Rita, Simpling, Sel Salamowit, sorry, I said that wrong, and Aminata. Good job, guys. Very good. Moving on to question number six. All errors in care, injuries to the patient, falls, accidents, or unexpected events during the course of care are called, one, minimum data set, two, sentinel events, three, mistakes, or four, incidents. So what is the following? All expected, or I'm sorry, all errors in care, injuries to the patient, falls, accidents, or unexpected events during the course of care are called, one, minimum data set, two, sentinel events, three, mistakes, or four, incidents. So what do you guys think? All errors in care, injuries to the patient, falls, accidents, or unexpected events. The correct answer here is incidents. Now I know a couple of you guys put sentinel events. I can see that here. A couple of you guys chose number two. Sentinel events are events, are incidents that happen that are very severe and put the patient's life or well-being at serious risk. So sentinel events is an incident, but it's like a really, really, really big incident. So that's not the right answer. All errors in care, injuries, falls, accidents, or unexpected events are termed incidents in medical facilities. So good job, guys. Most of you guys got that one right. Um, so it looks like, here's the score screen. Rita came in first on that one, followed by Robert, Tamika, Aminata, and Patricia. So we're going to move on now to question number seven. Moving on to question number seven. Here we go. A resident's health depends on how well you communicate your blank and concerns to the nurse. So a resident's health depends on how well you communicate your one, observations, two, complaints, three, critical personal issues, or four, daily tasks. So a resident's health depends on how well you communicate your observations, complaints, critical personal issues, or daily tasks, and concerns to the nurse. Yeah, this one's kind of hard without seeing it. I know. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, most of you guys got it right, though. Good. Very good. So a resident's health depends on how well you communicate your observations, complaints, critical personal issues or daily tasks and concerns to the nurse. And it looks like, okay, observations is correct. Good job. About half of you guys got that right. And I know this is a hard one if you can't see it because it's the blank is right in the middle of the question. Um, but yeah, a resident's health depends on how well you communicate your observations and concerns to the nurse. Nurse doesn't want to hear your complaints. <laughs> That's not why they're there. Um, critical personal issues don't really have any impact on the resident's health. And your daily tasks, well, yeah, you need to communicate your daily tasks, you know, and how well they're going to the nurse, but that's not what this is. That, that, that's not going to impact your patient's health. A resident's health is going to depend on how well you um, relay your observations while you're performing those daily tasks. So Salamawit came in first, followed by Kishwanda, uh, Blessed, Robert, and Alexa. Good. we got more people uh, chiming in here. I know you guys can't see the screen. I'm super, super, super sorry. I'm sorry. All right, here we are. Question number eight. We're half done. The most common type of accident in a healthcare setting is one, shock, two, burns, three, choking, or four, falls. 
What is the most common type of accident in a healthcare setting? Shock, burns, choking, or falls? Go ahead and lock in your answer. Lock in your answer. Most common type of accident in a healthcare setting is shock, burns, choking, or falls. Go ahead and choose one of those. Yeah, you guys are good. I can't stump you anymore. Look how good you are. All right. Uh, the correct answer here is, of course, you guys all got it right, falls. Yeah, absolutely. That is the most common type of accident in a healthcare setting. And that's one that we really, really need to um, make sure that we're watching for. And it's not just about, you know, water spilled in the hallway or, um, you know, uh, the patient uh, tripping over their oxygen tubing, although those are very good concerns that we need to watch out for. But it's also paying attention to our patients as well, because they're going to give us clues that something is not right. You know, they get a little wobbly or maybe a little pale or they may slow down or they may reach out for stability. Those are all signs that say, hey, something isn't right here. And to prevent a fall, we need to address it. So good job. Rita came in first on that one, followed by Salamawit, Helen, Tamika, and Simpling. Good job. Very good job. All right, moving on to question number nine. And again, I apologize. I know you guys can't see the questions this time. Which of the following is most useful to the nurse and the care team? So which of the following four things are most useful to the nurse and the care team? One, opinions. Two, facts. Three, interpretations. Or four, judgments. So which of the following is most useful to the nurse and the care team? Opinions. Facts interpretations or judgments? What do you guys think? Which of the following does the nurse and the care team find most helpful? Your opinion, facts, your interpretation, or your judgment? What do you guys think? Go ahead and lock in your final answers. Yeah, this one's a little trickier, isn't it? A little bit trickier. So which of the following is most useful to the nurse and the care team? And the right answer is facts. Yes, absolutely. You, um, as a CNA, should not be interjecting your opinion. Um, you shouldn't be interpreting what's happening with the patient, and you should not be making any judgments. All three of those, opinions, interpretations, and judgments, are reserved for licensed individuals. Now, I know we're certified. And some states even call CNAs licensed. But this requires advanced knowledge that the CNAs may not have. So it's best for us to stick to facts. Um, I noticed Mr. Jones was pale and sweaty. Not, I think Mr. Jones may be a fall risk. Salamawit, Tamika, Robert, Rita, and Raz came in um, in the top five on that one. All right, question number 10. If a patient who uses profanity when communicating with you, you should, one, communicate without using profanity or cursing, two, refuse to care for the patient because they're rude and mean, three, tell the nurse that the patient needs to be medicated for behavior issues, or four, curse back at the patient to show them how it feels. So if a patient is using profanity with communi when communicating with you, you should one, communicate without using profanity, two, refuse to care for the patient because they're being rude and mean, three, tell the nurse the patient needs to be medicated for behavior issues, or four, curse back at them to show them how it feels, teach them a lesson. So are we gonna communicate professionally? Refuse to care, ask for medication for the patient, or curse back at them and give them a taste of their own medicine. Yeah, the correct answer here, you guys all got it right, correct? One, yes, communicate without using profanity or cursing. We are being paid to remain professional. 
Your patient isn't paid to be a patient. They can act any way they want to. They're a patient. They're paying the bill. We have a responsibility to remain professional, even in the face of cursing. Now, I want you to remember, though, that we're not seeing our patients on their best day, are we? They've got some really serious stressors going on in their life, and that may come out as anger or frustration or even denial. So we need to be a little bit patient with our patients, especially if they're showing signs of stress like this. So Robert came in first on that one, followed by Salamawit, Simpling, Patricia, and Rita. Good job, guys. Moving on to question number 11. So only five questions left. Question number 11. Unconscious behaviors used to release tension or cope with stress by blocking uncomfortable or threatening feelings is called one, displacement, two, slang words, three, cliches, or four, defense mechanisms. So unconscious behaviors used to release tension or cope with stress by blocking uncomfortable or threatening feelings is called displacement, slang words, cliches, or defense mechanisms. So what are unconscious behaviors used to release tension or cope with stress? Displacement? Slang words, cliches, or defense mechanisms. Let's go ahead and lock in your final answer here. Uh, that's a long one, wasn't it? Yeah, it's hard when you can't see the screen. Um, yeah, defense mechanisms is correct. A defense mechanism, and this is the key, guys, a defense mechanism is an unconscious behavior. So your patient doesn't even realize that they're doing it or why they're doing it. But the whole purpose of a defense mechanism is literally to build a wall between that patient and their feelings and whatever is threatening them, right? So... Um, we need to understand that defense mechanisms are real and your patients are going to have a whole range of them because we're not seeing them on their best day. So uncomfortable and threatening feelings are all over the place in medicine. So we need to understand that defense mechanisms are also going to be in play as well. Good job, guys. So Salamowit came in first on that one, followed by Robert, Alexa, Simplang, and Patricia. Good job. Oh, the scores are pretty close, actually. Scores are close. All right, here we go. Question number 12. When caring for a visually impaired patient, which of the following are appropriate communication techniques? So one, always tell the patient when you enter and exit a room. Two, move the patient's furniture to the edges of the room. Three, keep the lighting in the room dim. Or four, make sure you touch the resident before speaking to them. So if we're caring for a visually impaired patient, which of the following communication technique is important? Always tell a patient when you enter and exit the room. Move the patient's furniture to the edges of the room. Keep the lighting in the room dim. Or make sure you touch the resident before speaking to them. So if we're caring for a visually impaired patient, are we going to tell them when we enter and exit the room? Are we going to move their furniture to the edges of the room? Are we going to keep the lighting dim? Or are we going to touch the resident before we speak to them? Go ahead and lock in your final answers. Yeah, we're going to tell them when we enter and exit the room. If they're visually impaired and they can't see, they need to be um, told verbally. Because otherwise we can startle them. Imagine for a second you've got some headphones on, you're listening to your favorite beats, and all of a sudden somebody touches you and you didn't think anybody was in the room. That would be a... Oh my gosh moment, right? You'd probably jump out of your skin. Well, when we have visually impaired patients and they don't see us enter the room, um, we have to at least acknowledge it verbally that somebody is in the room so that we're not startling them. We do not want to move their furniture. Please don't move furniture unless the resident asks you to. And we don't want to keep the lighting dim because they may have some vision. So we want to make sure that we're helping them with that. So Simplang... Tamika, Salamowit, Helen, and Blessed came in top five on that one. So Simplang, Tamika, Salamowit, good job. All right, so question 13. When describing where items are to a visually impaired patient, we often use 
long complicated descriptions, the alphabet song, the face of an imaginary clock, or written instructions. If we're trying to describe where items are to a visually impaired patient, do we want to use long complicated descriptions, the alphabet song, the face of an imaginary clock, or written instructions. So when describing where items are to a visually impaired patient, do we want to use long complicated descriptions, the alphabet song, the face of an imaginary clock, or written instructions? Ah, oh, you guys are split on this one. Yeah, the right answer here is the face of an imaginary clock. So you would say, um, you know, your patient's like right in the middle of the clock. So it would be, um, you know, your uh, card game is at the 12 o'clock position directly ahead. 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock. So it helps your patient orient where things are. We don't want to use written instructions. They're visually impaired. They may not be able to read the written instructions. We don't want long and complicated. We want easy. And the alphabet song here does not help at all. Not at all. So we're going to use the face of an imaginary clock. So you would say things like, um, you know, your water is at the four o'clock position. All right. Looks like Patricia came in first on that one, followed by Salamowit, Alexa, Blessed, and Helen. Good job, guys. Very good. Moving on to question number 14. Only two more to go. Which of the following statements are true regarding combative behavior? So which of these statements are true regarding combative behavior? One, it can be a sign of frustration or fear. Two, it's a way for the patient to show they don't like you. Three, it should always be taken personally. Or four, it must be dealt with using force and restraints. So if we have a patient demonstrating combative behavior, which of the following is true? One, it can be a sign of frustration or fear. Two, it's a way for them to show they don't like you. Three, it should always be taken personally. Or four, it must be dealt with using force and restraints. So if we have a combative patient, what do we know about that? Is it a sign of frustration or fear? Do they not like us? Should we take it personally? Or should we use force and restraints? Yeah, number one is correct. You guys all got that one right. Combative behavior is often a sign of fear or frustration. If you um, don't want to take a shower today, nobody's going to grab you and throw you in the shower and force you to shower because you're an adult. You can make that decision yourself. But if we have a patient that refuses to shower, we're not just going to pick them up and throw them in the shower, you know. We have to remember that the only way that they have to express their displeasure, their frustration, or their fear is often combative behavior. And we need to understand that they're, they're not always trying to be difficult or give us a hard time. They're having a hard time, right? So keep that in mind. Um, we don't always deal with combative behavior with force and restraints. We actually try to back up and see if we can adjust our approach instead. So good job, guys. Very good job. Looks like Rita came in first on this one, followed by Robert, Alexa, Blessed, and Patricia. Good job. Final question. Hi, Marie. Final question. Here we go. I know this one was hard this week. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, this is a fill in the blank in the middle of the question. <laughs> Standing with your feet blank gives a greater base of support. So standing with your feet, one, shoulder width apart, two, close together, three, one in front of the other, or four, turned outward, gives you a wider base or a greater base of support. So how do we want to stand if we want a greater base of support? Shoulder width apart, close together, one in front of the other, or turned outward. So how do we want our feet positioned to give us a greater base of support? One, shoulder width apart, two, close together, three, one in front of the other, 
or four turned outward. So here we go. And the correct answer is, yeah, absolutely, shoulder width apart. You guys all got that one right. Congratulations. Good job. Yeah, shoulder width apart gives you the best stability. So if we're going to be lifting something heavy, transferring a patient, um, anything like that, you want that wide base of support so that you're uh, more stable and not knocked off balance where you can pull the patient over and injure you or them or both. Yeah, so standing with your feet shoulder width apart gives you a greater base of support. And that question, that type of question, could be on the state exam because they really are focusing on body mechanics. Because remember, injuries are the number one reason that CNAs leave the field. So we wanna prevent injuries. Robert came in first on that one, followed by Rita, Blessed, Carlene, and Raz. Good job, guys. Very good job. So, hold on, let me get to my screen here. Here we go. Okay, so um, for you guys um, that I'm about to, uh, to tell you, you're going to send me an email to foryourcna at gmail.com. You can uh, see it in the chat there. And here we go. So first, second, and third place winners. Rita came in first. Salamawit came in second. And Robert came in third. So you guys all need to send me um, your name, your actual real name, your screen name, what place you came in, and your mailing address to that email address. So... Rita came in first. And, hold on. <laughs> Salamawit came in second. Oops. I got to make sure I say this right. Okay, second is Salamawit, and third is Robert. So you three, make sure that you send me your screen name. Make sure you send me your real name and your mailing address and what place you came in. And we'll get your prizes out to you in the mail this week. We're very quick with this. Um, and uh, you have to be in uh, the United States for us to mail it because I can't mail international. I don't have that capability yet. So Rita came in first, congratulations to you. Salama Witt came in second and Robert came in third. We are super, super proud of you. You guys are all fantastic. Next time I promise to have all of my ducks in a row and uh, make this go a little bit smoother. Um, but remember that we have the question of the day on our social media. So if you haven't, uh, screen name, uh, Helen, it, it's just whatever your screen name is. Some people use names like, um, Blessed at Ricketts, uh, I would need to know their actual real name. You know, so if, if your screen name is not your real name, you need to let me know. Um, so, Helen, I think that yours is actually your name. <laughs> All right, so next, uh, next time I'm hoping to have this a little better tuned in. But um, remember, we'll be back on the 3rd um, Tuesday of January. I don't know what the date is for that, but we do this on the 1st and the 3rd, so the 16th, 16th, the 1st and the 3rd uh, Tuesday of every month we do the game show, and I'll, I promise to be better um, <laughs> for the next one. All right, so for those of you that don't know, I start my next CNA class next Monday. Next Monday. So the 8th, we have a CNA class. We live stream our CNA classes. So you guys can tune in anywhere in the world and actually sit in on our live instruction and ask questions if you want to or interact with other students. It's a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. If you are going to join our class, there's no charge for it. It's live. It's free. You can sit in on my classes. If you are going to sit in, though, we do suggest you buy the book. And if you buy it now, you'll get it in time for class. So if you're going to be joining us for our live classroom live stream, go ahead and head over to my website, foryourcna.com, and click on Shop and order the CNA Skills Study Guide so you're all set for class on Monday. Hope to see you there. Um, we'll see you again on the 16th for the next um, 
uh, live game show where we're going to give out prizes. And uh, please remember that um, we're not doing our live weekly right now. I've got some other things to do. But you can look at our social media for questions of the day as well. And uh, thank you, Blessed. We're so happy to have you. And uh, stay tuned because later this year we're going to have some new prizes as well for the game show. So I'm really excited about that. All right. I hope you guys have a fantastic beginning to your year. And uh, you're able to um, have peace and joy and blessings abundant. So we will see you guys in two weeks. Or if you're going to join our live stream for our class, we'll see you on Monday. Um, so sorry this one didn't go the way I wanted it to. You couldn't see the questions, but we'll get that fixed. And we'll see you next time. Until then, happy caregiving. Bye.